Hey guys, I'm Sai and welcome to Ace Podcast Nation. Uh, we're a channel that features podcasts, interviews and content on all sorts of subjects. We have shows, uh, shows released, recorded and scheduled on various subjects including mental health, football, films, TV, wrestling, music, conspiracy theories and more. Today's episode is our third episode, our third podcast on mental health and our second in our series on ADHD. Uh, we previously did a show on depression and grief with football journalist Phil Brown. Uh, we discussed the subject in detail. It was an extremely emotional show for both myself and Phil uh, as we shared our experiences with grief and some of the issues that manifested uh, afterwards. Obviously, Phil had a particularly heartbreaking show, a uh, particularly heartbreaking experience. Uh, it was difficult, but it was worth it just for the, uh, the messages that we received afterwards. Uh, with people just talking about their own uh, experiences and struggles, which made it all worthwhile. Uh, we also did a show on ADHD with mental health support worker Jacob. Uh, they both both shows had really good viewing figures and feedback, but like I say, the best thing was definitely all the messages that I received afterwards. Thank you me for talking about the subject, raising awareness, and a couple of people who sort of admitted to just being struggling themselves. Uh, so today's show is going to be uh, from the parent side of having children with ADHD. Obviously, uh, my eldest son has ADHD, so I've got a little bit of experience with it. But I, what I was keen to get other people's experience because two children might not be the same, but they both might have ADHD and they both might have different symptoms. Uh, my today's guest is an ADHD counsellor and from ADHDpositive.co.uk. Uh, and I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Chantal Branson to the show today. Welcome, Chantal, and thanks for coming on. Morning. Thanks for having me. No worries. It's, uh, so, like I said, we wanted just to discuss it uh, from a different point of view. We spoke to Jacob about uh, ADHD, you know, in adulthood and his day-to-day -day life and how it affects his job. Uh, and he's got a young child and he discussed how that affected his life with that. Um, next week, I'm speaking to Dr. Mohammed about the sort of medical and clinical side. Uh, so today, we, I wanted to get the parents' point of view, uh, you know, just to all the hurdles and different things you've been through and you go through on a daily basis, uh, being a parent to a child with ADHD. Um, so if it's all right with you, we'll sort of start from the beginning, mm -hmm. um, sort of testing process and things like initial symptoms. And then sort of work our way through if that's okay um so how many how many children do you have so i have three children three boys and um, two okay. of the children are diagnosed with adhd okay so um if we sort of start with the the eldest one who's got uh, adhd did what were the initial sort of symptoms that you noticed uh with them and sort of what did you think at first, if I, if you get what I mean, sort of, was it like uh, an instant thing, like, oh, I think they've got ADHD, or was it a more of a gradual thing uh, that you um, noticed different Okay, so um, he was a, um, a restless baby from, from being very tiny, really. Um, he, ha he was very sensitive, so he developed allergies and... Um, uh, things like eczema and um, food allergies, milk intolerances and things. And he was just quite agitated from, from a very young age. Um, when he, he, was, he was desperate to be off, you know, he, was, he, he wasn't a baby that would sit still or happy to kind of just amuse himself. He wanted this constant stimulation from being very young, um, which was quite a different experience to having an older child who was very placid and very um, calm. And I think when my um, middle son was about 15 months old, he started being quite aggressive. He would lash out, kind of throw himself about. Um, and I, I, I just remember thinking, why, why is he behaving like this? Where have you got this from? And, um, you know, you think that behavior is learned, but um, he, would, he would pull your hair and um, just he would go and kind of lashed out at the dog and, and uh, it was just all very confusing and I, I went to the health visitor and I said oh um you know I'm a bit worried about my child he seems to be um 
quite aggressive and she would come and observe him and say oh you know you're doing everything right and um but right from a very young um age the symptoms were there and uh, yeah yeah i think um yeah, well i experienced something similar with my my son he um he was very restless and he was constantly sort of quite hyperactive uh, mm -hmm. didn't always want to listen and I mean from from my point of view I my wife picked up on it similar sort of thing to you um she sort of was, would say like you know something doesn't seem right he seems a bit too uh agitated and whatnot and he's very emotional and I, I always just said oh no he's just a boy and obviously he was our first first child so obviously with your first child you just you it's new to you um so I was very much, I didn't, I would, I think I was, like, I didn't consider it. I was just, oh, no, he's fine, he's a boy. And I was sort of put it down to that. Um, and as he got older, it sort of developed into a bit more, uh, more issues and issues within school with concentration and things like that. So mm -hmm. with, um, so with the child then, was, did you, where did it go from the health visitor then? Did you? Did he have issues when he went up into sort of nursery and school? Um, yes, yes, he did. Yeah, he started nursery and it was just so overwhelming for him um, that I decided I would keep him at home for a bit longer because I just didn't feel that he was ready at that time. Um, I think, you know, other people were like, oh, what, why are you doing that? But I just knew my son and it was it was my decision. Um, he did eventually go to nursery and you know he did he did manage but it was very play based and they were very um aware of of his difficulties and he used to tend to play uh, alone a lot um and then other children also you know they they get to know um how to approach their peers and so they would just know to leave him alone really because if they interfered with what he was doing he might be um a bit cross with them um i was backwards and forwards to um the doctor saying, you know, I think that my son could have ADHD, um, and he was. Uh, he started school at four, and he found it incredibly difficult. He was just um, aloof, really. He was quite uh, wild and always going in the opposite direction, not sitting still, and not processing what the teachers were saying. He did get quite a, a negative um, reputation. He, he could be aggressive, um, and it's very, very challenging. Um, he was diagnosed at five. Okay. So, I mean, I don't know what, obviously, I live in Wales and you live in England, so I'm not sure of the differences in the process uh, which you had. Uh, with, uh, with my son, he wasn't diagnosed, I think, until year seven, start of year seven. So mm -hmm. I think that's like 11, which I think is quite late, I think, generally. but And, and a lot of that was down to my sort of stubbornness um, and I think it was only with us I think year six the end of primary school his teacher sort of floated the idea that maybe he had ADHD and explained the issues that he was having mm -hmm. um, so then so in Wales <clears throat> in order to get tested you have to be referred by the school or by the GP um, so the issue we had was the school told us to go to the GP to get referred because it's quicker, but the GP told us that you had to go to the be referred by the school. So we went back and forth several times trying to get one of them to refer him to be tested, uh, mm. and it was exhausting. And it's also frustrating because we, you know, all the time while he's not being tested or diagnosed, he's not getting the support in school that he needed. Um, and it, this became a big issue for us in like the first year of high school because the school simply wouldn't give him any of the support that children with ADHD need and get mm. until he was diagnosed. But the diagnosis and the testing was taking so long. So we spent a large part of his first year of high school in trouble, not being able to concentrate, very frustrated because he was getting in trouble. Um, and it was a very upsetting time for him. Obviously, 
in your situation, uh, he was diagnosed at five, so that's a bit earlier. Um, with so with your with your son, did you find what was your initial reaction when you know when you see you? Or actually, before we go there, um, in regards to getting him tested for ADHD, did, were you able to just go to a doctor and just get sort of get that process started, or did it need to be you know referred by the school or What's the process there for you? Um, we had, I had been to the doctors with my son and he was also under, under a paediatrician um, to do with his, his allergies because they, they were quite severe. Um, but it was our third referral into Cali's by the time he, he was um, offered the assessment. So um, he, he'd, been, um, he'd been first referred through the GP at the age of three um, so we got the diagnosis and I think <clears throat> the trouble is, is you're right in what you say, unless you get um, the diagnosis, you don't necessarily get the support. But even then, when you do have the diagnosis, I think it can still be really difficult uh, in accessing the right, um, the right support and, and getting that understanding for your child. Um, but I didn't yeah. find it, I didn't, uh, the, it was a third referral, but I didn't find it too difficult in terms of, of um, getting the diagnosis from my older son? Yeah, I think um, probably I think it probably helped by the sounds of it that he was under a paediatri paediatrician already, um, you know, in terms of the length of time. But I mean, even, like you say, you had to go back a few times. We, um, it was very fr frustrating for us because the school agreed that he needed help and he, mm -hmm. they, you know, there was something going on. The doctors agreed, or the GP agreed. Yeah, it looks like you know he may have ADHD, and he needs probably some support in school. But they couldn't put it in place until he had his diagnosis. So it's it's all very well for them to say, you know, wait for the referral, go to this place, go to that place. But all you know, day on daily life, he's going to school. He's struggling with his emotions. He's struggling with frustration. He's struggling with concentration he's got to live with that and then obviously the family unit has got to deal with the the result of all of that um so after you you had the diagnosis what um you know how did you feel initially when you were told yeah he's got adhd um uh, well i think i knew that he had adhd but i think that um it's still very difficult because you, um, I think as a parent, the natural disposition is still to question yourself and you're still questioned by so many other people, even your friends and your family, they've all got something to say with regards to how you should be parenting or how they should be behaving um, and you, you, you still don't lose that sense of self-blame sometimes and you're still questioning whether it's right, you know, there's a lot that we're talking um, eight years ago, and I know there's still a lot of stigma now as to what ADHD is, whether it's um, uh, environmental or um, genetic. And um, so we still faced a lot of criticism, a lot of judgment. Um, my son was still very rejected by his peers. Um, he was still very complained about by his peers, by teachers, by other parents. So it was still very, very difficult. Yeah, it's, it's very disheartening as well, <clears throat> or certainly I found with us is like you feel like uh, other parents are sort of looking down on you almost because your child is not behaving the way that they think they should behave, particularly when they're younger. Um, obviously, in my our case, like when my son was sort of five, six, seven, mm -hmm. uh, we didn't know that he had ADHD. At Point. But he's still, uh, you know, similar issues to what, what you just mentioned, and with his peers and other parents and people and teachers, it's very much. Well, he should be doing this. Everyone else is doing this. So why isn't he? And it, it's very frustrating, and it can be very, you know, as a parent, it can be very disheartening. Um, and I know, like when we found out that he had ADHD, it was almost a, like a relief for us because we knew that now we could push the school for that support and they wouldn't push back. 
Um, so he did get the support he needed in school. But like from a personal point of view, I felt very guilty once he had that diagnosis because I felt like he had had the last sort of five or six years of not having maybe the support or even the treatment that could have helped him because of my stubbornness. And then, of course, the more I read about ADHD, because as I mentioned to you before, I'm, I was very ignorant, ignorant towards it before this all sort of came up. Um, and I was reading, like, it can be passed down hereditary and things like that. So that was, like, from a personal point of view, I found that very difficult. Um, now, obviously, my son was, I think, probably about 12 when he found out and he was diagnosed officially, if you like. Um, and he was, even though he knew, you know, he knew he was old enough, he knew what was going on, he knew he was going to be tested, he knew that he probably had ADHD. When he found out, he was extremely emotional. Um, mm -hmm. And I had many conversations with him. You know, he, he just said things like, I, I just want to be normal, I just want to be like everyone else. And it was a very trying time for him. Obviously, it was his first year in high school. And then to sort of have that, and it took him a while, I think, to come to terms with, you know, I've got ADHD. Um, so one of the good, one of the good things I think for him was that he could understand some of the things that he was doing and why. But then equally to him, he wanted to just be or feel as if he was just normal in inverted commas. Because, you know, what is normal at the end of the day? Um, yeah. Obviously, your son was younger. Um, as he got older, did you find that... He, did he ask questions about, you know, like the fact that he's got ADHD? Or did he... Or did it because, because he was only five when you found out and you had him tested? Was it just a part of sort of his day-to-day -day life? And, you know, that's just the way it is. Um, well, if I just go back to what you were saying yeah, before yeah. about, um, you know, feeling really guilty and feeling that you were ignorant of ADHD, I think that's um, a, a common thing because you don't know unless you experience it. And um, I can relate to that entirely because my older son just flew through school and he was such a calm and placid child and he did really well. And I think... I used to, I think there was an element of me crediting myself with that. I was like, oh, I'm such a good parent because my child's doing so well. But actually, I think I'm more inclined to say that children do well if they can do well now. And of course, yes, the, the parental support and the family support um, is, is a factor in how children develop. But yes, I think that children can do well if they can do, well, children will do well if they can do well. Um, uh, going forwards to um, how my son feels about his ADHD, well, I think um, I think it's not necessarily the the label of ADHD that was the problem. I think it was um, his developing perception based on his experiences. So the the criticisms, the judgments, the constant um, negative comments that been learning that he wasn't good enough and learning that he was naughty and bad and um, just not getting that understanding around him despite the, having the diagnosis. Um, so I think maybe it's because he was so young that ADHD just been something that's accepted um, by him. Um, but I don't, I think it is difficult for children to be, to be labelled with a disorder but I think it's equally you know, it, uh, difficult, if, well, more so difficult if they just don't know. They don't know um, why they have got no understanding of um, themselves. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, as, as a child with, with or without ADHD, um, it's difficult enough, isn't it? Find, they're trying to find who they are, especially, you know, as they get up into towards the end of primary school and going into high school, they're still testing boundaries and still trying to find out their personality, what they like, what they don't like. Um, and I think when you, particularly as a teenage boy, you've got all the hormones and things of just a normal teenager, and then you factor in 
some of the issues which come with ADHD, it can be very trying. I mean, I got to be honest, some days I feel like I'm fighting a losing battle just to get through the day. Um, but then I think he feels like that too. He's so focused on trying to make sure that he behaves a certain way and he's well behaved and he's trying to be good and concentrate and do all the things that he should he knows that he should be doing. I think that takes toll on him mentally by the end of the each day because he's trying very hard to fit in to this you know, the way that he's gotta to go to school and he's gotta to go to lessons and he's gotta do this and that. So I think that is difficult. And I think it's difficult for any child, any teenager. And I think it's even more difficult if you've got ADHD. Um, and obviously, as children, they're trying to come to terms with the fact that they've got a disorder, which not everyone has got. Um, so it is, it's a, I can imagine, like, obviously, I'm only going on my own experiences in terms of how we try to deal with it and how we try and help him deal with it. But it's not easy for them as much as it's not easy for, you know, as parents to, to navigate the various issues which come along with it. Um, could, so could you tell me, like, what sorts of, sort of difficulties um, you, your children have so with ADHD on, like, a daily basis? What would, excuse me, sorry, what would some of the, you know, some of the just the day-to-day hurdles or issues you might encounter which sort of stem from you know ADHD within the household so um my children are quite um high energy quite intense and um, they change direction so frequently uh, so it can be difficult to keep up with them um obviously as a family we've all evolved with with the ADHD so um and we're quite attuned to each other but it you know that's not me saying that it's easy at all because you know emotions can be quite um fragile um volatile um overwhelmed you know and the children can be quite emotional especially if they've had a really difficult day and they're just exhausted and and as i say overwhelmed from having to concentrate at school or or hearing um a negative comment for example my son just he, he got so overwhelmed in his sats this is my younger son and mm-hmm. um, that he, he he was sat there and he wanted to get out of his chair and he was really trying to keep himself together and he just couldn't and eventually he said i wanted to shout but i cut my hair instead and i bit my finger really hard and i eventually i just screwed up the paper and all that's happening internally for him and the teacher just sees this child that's screwing up the paper and then her immediate reaction is to, to shout at him despite the fact that she knows that he's got ADHD and um, you know and then on top of all this kind of overwhelm and frustration my son seeing everybody else being able to just sit and concentrate um, you know it, it's, it's really distressing um, so at home yes I've talked about um high emotions changing direction high energy my children will you know you could come into my house and see them hanging upside down on the sofa doing cartwheels backflips we have um lots of and that's okay in our house because they need that and trying to um, make them sit still and and be calm it's just it's fruitless really because it's not going to happen and it's just going to cause more more frustration and more upset so we have um, a monkey bar, uh, a monkey a pull-up bar. They hang on, swing off that. Yeah, they do um, all kinds of crazy things. Yeah, this sounds quite um, very similar. We've got like a pull-up bar, which they, uh, you know, they all use. It's particularly if it's like, you know, it's raining and you can't go outside and get rid of some of that energy. That's a handy thing to have to hang and uh, hang about. And, you know, it's it's like... It's very difficult. I've got a 14-year-old who's got ADHD, and then I've got a 12-year-old and a 10-year-old. So obviously, they're quite close together in age, but equally, the 14-year-old perhaps doesn't have the same interests as a 10-year-old. Um, and if he's 
if the oldest one's had a bad day or just a hard day in terms of the work he's had to do in school and he feels quite compressed where he's had to be, try and behave a certain way and concentrate and they can clash and it can go from, you know, just around to very volatile in seconds. Um, so, we, you know, we do speak to the younger two and, you know, explain that, look, he is going to react and he is going to, particularly later in the day. So, sorry, I'm skipping back and forth a bit there. So my son, uh, he started taking medication about towards the end of year seven, which again, I was completely against. So, I, you know, I'd sort of come around to the fact of ADHD and he'd been tested and all that, but I was still like, I don't want to medicate him. I don't think it's right, etc. You know, general stigma, which is attached to it. Um, but I was very against it, but we tried different things and he had some support in school. And um, it was interesting, one of the things which you said there about the teacher knew that your son had ADHD, but still reacted to him as if he was, you know, any other child who didn't have the same sort of issues. Because what we feel we found in high school, obviously they have a different teacher for different subjects, so it's different each lesson. And we found, you know, you could have one teacher who is exceptionally understanding, gives them gives him a lot of leeway, will do his best to help him, and will probably let him get away with some, some things that other children would be told off for, things like shouting out or fidgeting. You know, they've got, like, different fidget toys and stuff. But then he could go into the next lesson, and you'll have a teacher who quite clearly doesn't have any faith in ADHD as a thing, doesn't allow any leeway, treats him exactly as any other child would te be treated, which immediately causes issues if, if he's struggling in that lesson or if he doesn't like that lesson because that teacher's just, there's conflict within minutes, um, which makes it very difficult for us because we're trying to tell him, look, you've got to concentrate in school and you go and you do the best you can. Do you, you, know, you know what you need to do. It's just trying to make sure you do it. And break the, we tried to get him to break the lessons down into five or ten minute blocks and say, right, I've done it for ten minutes. Try again now for the next ten minutes. If you've got a teacher who's not on board with trying to help or even just understanding, it's very difficult to avoid that conflict. If you think... Even as an adult, if someone comes to you and they want conflict and they instigate conflict, it is very difficult to avoid. It's very difficult to control your emotions and not react to someone who says something to upset you or says, you know, do you know what I mean? So yeah, I think, yeah, I think um... from a teacher point of view, it's difficult because you want, you've got one teacher who could do things one way. So then he goes into the next lesson thinking, oh, the last teacher gave me this little bit of leeway, but then the next teacher doesn't believe in ADHD. It's not a thing. So he's, he's out the lesson, missing the work, in trouble. Then he's emotional and frustrated going into the next lesson. And it can snowball very, very quickly. It absolutely can, yeah. And that's why it's so vital that there is that understanding and there are those reasonable adjustments in the classroom because, um, as you said, the, um, the confrontation and the conflict, it just doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't elicit the um, desired effect. You know, there's no um, resolve then. Things just escalate. Things can get out of control. Children can get um, taken out of the classroom. They can get excluded. Um, I'm very fortunate in one respect in that I've been able to fight really quite hard for my children, but it's been a long battle for both of them. And I have got education, health and care plans for both of them. So that it's, it's absolutely imperative, you know, that's a legal document now that states these are my child's difficulties, these are his needs, this is what must be done. Um, and it's enforceable. So um, I think for any parent that has a child that's really, really struggling in school or is very misunderstood or or things are escalating and they're not coping. I think getting the right support is really, 
crucial and I think um, you know, there's lots of legislation that parents can rely on that schools must kind of put things into place. The Equality Act for one, you know, they're not allowed to discriminate against these children who are maybe behaving in a certain way, but it's as a direct consequence of their own ADHD. So, um, you know, screaming and shouting at a child for something that's not within their control is, is discrimination, really. Yeah, of course. And I mean, if, for instance, if you had um, like something like Tourette's and you were fidgeting or, or twitching or like shouting out inappropriate things, mm -hmm. you wouldn't shout at that child for doing those things because they can't help it. So if you know that as a teacher or a school, if you know that a child has got certain issues, just as if, um, if for instance, they know that like a marriage is breaking down or there's trouble at home for a child, they'll take that into account if he starts getting, in, or he or she starts getting into trouble or whatever it may be, they'll take into account that that child is going through some sort of emotional turmoil due to a situation at home. So equally, you should take into account, right, this child has got ADHD. So certain things that they're doing or the way they're reacting cannot be helped. They can't control it. And I wish, I do wish that every teacher, every teacher was able to do that. And I don't know whether it's uh, just some of them don't believe that you know because obviously there is there is people out there who believe that it's like I like I think you said is that they believe it's completely environmental and it's a choice that these people make or children make or adults make it's not they cannot help it they get to a point where they are not able to control what they're doing particularly if they've been in a situation for like a test like you mentioned with your son where he felt completely overwhelmed you know, he can't do anything about that. So he should not be shouted at and punished because that's that feeling as an adult, if you feel overwhelmed, that's difficult to deal with. If you're a child feeling overwhelmed, you, you know, a small child would stamp their feet or throw something or whatever it may be. Um, and, a, and an older child or a teenager might sort of lash out verbally or you know, throw a, push a chair or whatever it may be. And a, a child with ADHD is more likely to do those things because they feel overwhelmed so often. And um, a big thing which I always bring up when I talk about, like, my son and people with ADHD is being able to control their emotions. Their emotions are almost like at this... I always say to my son, it's like a balancing, balancing act where... It could go one way or the other very quickly. So you've got to try and, if, for instance, if you shout and you scream, the only thing that's coming back is shouting and screaming. It's not going to calm the situation. It's not going to stop them doing what they're doing. It's going to make them feel worse, and they're going to just escalate whatever they is they're doing at that point. So in in with our school, once he had the diagnosis, they immediately then. <laughs> Pretty much instantly, we went for a meeting, and they set up um, like a a learning plan of things that they could do to support him, which was positive, obviously. But it's infuriating because it was nothing that they couldn't have done for him before. But I don't know whether it was them or the local authority which stops them doing it. But it's incredibly frustrating because it wasn't like or. Oh, they needed a letter to say, oh, he's got ADHD, so now we can do these things. It was just go for a meeting. This is what we can do. He can go to the learning centre if he needs some sort of time to chill out or be, you know, some quiet time or go and speak to someone who's trained and help him work through his emotions or his frustrations. So we did find that frustrating that why couldn't that have been there even though he didn't have a diagnosis? I feel like if a child has got any sort of struggles or issues, they should have some sort of support, whether they've been diagnosed with ADHD or whether they haven't. Yeah, that was frustrating. 
I'd agree with you, yes, because my younger son, he is 11 and he wasn't diagnosed until he was 10. But I knew from being from him being young that he was very impulsive, that he was quite hyperactive. They're different children and ADHD presents differently in, in each person to some, to, to many extents, actually. Um, so my older child was far more aggressive. It was more severe. Um, but my younger child was very impulsive and um, very hyperactive, quite restless and high energy and um, lacking in the concentration skills. But it wasn't as, as prominent or severe as his older brother. So I didn't, and having had the experience of the older one, I didn't want that. Um, I didn't want to go down the diagnosis route because, well, there were many factors in that decision, all that that thought, and um, it was, oh, people are just going to think it is me because now I'm saying my other child's got ADHD. Um, or he doesn't need the label. My other son's been really pushed out. We're just going to get through this. And I really tried to speak to the school and say to him, look, you know, I feel he's got difficulties with concentration. Um, I feel that he's quite restless. Um, and I had the same thing as you. The support wasn't there, but it's it's not right. If there's a, you know, but there needs to be more training and more awareness for teachers and more resources, I guess, in schools to be able to support these children. And so I did. I did go down the um, assessment route for my younger son, and he's he he is now diagnosed and. As with the older child, I had a lot of um, um, meetings at school and trying to advocate for him. And eventually, once the diagnosis was in place, I was able to say, well, actually, now, you know, you have a, a legal responsibility because my son has a disability and he is protected under the Equality Act and you must make these reasonable adjustments for him otherwise you're discriminating against him and i think you have to get that kind of tough perspective with, with schools in the end because otherwise you just may as well keep banging your head against the brick wall in, in many circumstances i'm sure there are lots of parents who maybe have got um really good schools and their children are supported but in my experience in, and in countless other experiences of other families they're not getting the right support and they things are escalating and children aren't achieving what their potential is and they are getting pushed out and um they're learning to develop very negative self-concepts very um poor feelings towards education and it's just not good for anybody the outcomes that it, it, it's it needs to change no and i think they take that negativity negativity into their adult life then, won't they? Um, so I gotta say, after I sort of moaned a bit about his school, and particularly before he was diagnosed, since his diagnosis, he has had appropriate support. He's had people mm. he can go to, he's had people in the class on and off with him who are just there to help him sort of do the things he needs to do. Um, and despite me being really against that, we did end up agreeing to put him on medication. And I have to say that since he started the medication at the end of year seven, he's all in school. He's almost done a complete U-turn. So mm -hmm. he's struggling in year seven. He was struggling to fit in. He didn't have many friends. He was isolated. He was frustrated. He was angry a lot. Whereas now he's in the sort of the top sets of I think all or most subjects. He's doing very well in school. He hasn't been in trouble. He hasn't been in any fights. Um, so he has managed to turn it round. What we find is in the more first thing in the morning is very difficult. Obviously, he hasn't sort of taken his medication. Then that's very difficult to navigate because he's hyperactive. He hasn't had medication since the morning before, so you really notice the, the loudness, the aggression, the, the difficulty in just getting showered and dressed and ready for school. Mm -hmm. It can become like almost like this big, huge battle. But then an hour after he's taken his medication, he's pretty good. You know, I'm not going to say that he's this 
perfect child who does no wrong and is polite all the time. You know, he's a teenager. We still have all the teenage issues with attitudes and rudeness and, you know, everything. But from a school point of view, once he got the support, he has managed to achieve what he's capable of from an ability point of view. Whereas how many kids out there who either the school doesn't give them the same support that my son's got now, or they haven't been diagnosed, so they don't get the support, or they're just struggling through school. They've been written off as naughty kids. They've been suspended or excluded permanently, and then more issues come and they go to special schools or whatever it, you know, whatever it may escalate into. And I worry that not every school will do what his school has done for him after his diagnosis. Not every kid will have had their diagnosis because they might not have had, uh, the parents might not have been knowledgeable about it. They might not have been under like a pediatrician or something like that for someone to say, or their primary school or school are not proactive in telling the parents that, or look, we think he might have ADHD or we think he's got some sort of issue with his concentration or his behavior. If they haven't got that initial, I wouldn't say support, but advice or knowledge, you know, how many kids out there are not achieving what they can achieve because they haven't got the support or the knowledge or whatever it may be? And that worries me. It wouldn't have worried me 10 years ago, but as a parent now, it does worry me. It worries me for kids all over the country, all over the world, if you like, that aren't getting the support or the things they need to achieve what they can. And at the end of the day, you know, every person is different. Every child is different. Everybody reacts and learns in a different way. Some people respond to being told off and told, no, this is how you do it. Some people respond better to praise and whatever it may be. Do you know what I mean? And that's just people without ADHD. So I think I'm sure that there's lots of families around, you know, England, Wales, Scotland, who aren't getting the same support that we had or aren't getting the same advice. And those kids just get written off as naughty or whatever it may be and excluded. Yeah, Would we you... know that happens. I think um, there's lots of children that are undiagnosed and lots of adults that have gone through childhood undiagnosed and, and remain undiagnosed. And uh, as I said before, they just have this um, negative self-concept. They can be quite angry people because the world has taught them to be angry and the world has kind of rejected them. Um, so um, awareness is, is increasing and it, it needs to continue to increase. Training needs to continue to increase. Um, parents need to find ways of, of advocating for the children, seek support. Um, there's lots of online um, social media support groups where you can get information and advice um, and know your child and um, you know, be confident in expressing what you are experiencing. Yeah, and I think that's a big part of it is, is, is sort of getting the word out that there is, if you're not getting the support or the help, from your school or your local authority, there is charities and there is people out there who can help and will help. And I think that's important. And an important message to get out there is to people is that even if this, you feel like you're alone or you feel like there's nowhere to turn or you're just every day is a battle or you're struggling, is if you can't get the help from your GP or your uh, school, there is other ways to go. There is other places to turn who can help you. Um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, there was just a couple more things I wanted to ask you really about your day-to-day -day stuff. Is mm -hmm. um, what sort of, um, <clears throat> well, how, how does ADHD, for instance, affect your day-to-day -day life as a parent? So obviously, 
you had <clears throat> you've got your older um, older son who's uh, who's you know an adult, and then you've got your younger children now with <clears throat> two of which have got ADHD. How does that you know how how you know, I don't I don't want to say compared to your older son because that's not fair. But what I mean is like ADHD will have an effect on you every single day in some form. Um, so I was hoping you could just explain that better than I can. <laughs> well, for my um, older son who, who did go through school, no problems, um, he was an only child for quite a long time and, you know, he, he was used to having um, my attention and um, having a calm home life. And then he has these two new brothers and they um they're not they're the opposite of calm and they demand so much of my attention and so he did have to become very independent and in many respects I felt like he um kind of got pushed out and as well as much as he got pushed out he also learned to isolate himself because he just couldn't handle the 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 chaos and the temper and the and the high emotions it was too much so he would retreat a lot um and that was difficult because i would feel guilty about that um as a parent of two children with adhd you're just so aware that um the emotion and the tone of the house can change at any given moment um maybe you could compare that to treading on eggshells some of the time but as I said, we've evolved with ADHD, so we, we're very good at knowing how to manage it. Um, the, the two children do kind of um, clash, you know, one will um, agitate the other one and the other one will be so easily agitated. Um, so it, it can be it can be tricky. Yeah, I think treading on eggshells is the perfect um, sort of analogy, I think. I very much feel like that some days, but um, I can relate like to what you said about your um, your other son feeling almost like you feel a bit guilty that they're not quite having as much attention. And I don't mean in you know they still are involved and you don't isolate them, but it's just like my middle son is very calm and he's very polite and well behaved. And then his older brother's obviously got ADHD and is the opposite to that. The younger one, i got to be honest, we think he's sort of borderline. I think the one thing which makes us think perhaps he hasn't got ADHD is that in, work, uh, in school he's doing very well and he seems to be concentrating very well. But he's very, he's, his personality is very boisterous, he's very loud. And I'm sure some of that is picked up from his older brother just learn behavior as brothers yeah. you know brothers would do um but the middle one i think because he's quite quiet and calm he finds it quite difficult sometimes and i think the the, the, the noise levels and the chaos sometimes can affect him so we obviously you know we try and make time to speak to him and explain it to him and make sure that you know he understands and he's all right and i think generally he doesn't mind it but sometimes, for instance, sometimes he'll walk to school on his on his own or with his friends a bit earlier, just so he can get away from the the sort of the madness of trying to get ready and the noise levels and the sort of because he knows that that's the most problematic part of the day. So I can certainly relate to that sort of that feeling. <clears throat> um, difficult for them you know my son my older son kind of really did disengage from us because why would he want to come um swim in with us when he would be getting towed off by the lifeguard or um you know my son would be climbing under the um changing rooms or, or uh, and running off in the opposite direction it was just stressful so of course they, he's going to want to retreat from that yeah it's it's, it's, it's natural isn't it it's something like a just a natural reaction to sort of almost not well, I suppose like steer clear of it and I suppose just I think it's minimizing them the exposure to chaos and stress I think that's what you know he'd like yeah. to do 
but it is sad because you want them to be involved you want to be um a, a tight net family especially yeah, when you are also experiencing isolation and rejection from other places because you can't just rock up to someone's house for a cup of coffee because you know your kids are going to climb on their curtains or jump on their dog or uh, it's not it's not quite so um like that anymore because my children are getting older and it's getting it is getting easier in some respect but um you know you're, you're on edge you're constantly on edge thinking oh god what are going to do and how are you going to manage them i used to say it was like an episode of super nanny everywhere i went because one would be one in one direction and one would be in another direction and people would look at me like you have no control over those children do you and i'm like no i do not <laughs> yeah i can certainly relate to that and i think one of the things which we've found and we still find perhaps not as much but we still do is that it's like almost like you think oh should we go and do something and then it sort of dawns on your heart oh, if we go there or go and see these people or we go out there it's going to be chaos and like you say climbing on chairs and just perhaps things which are inappropriate to other people because they're not used to it and they don't understand so then you almost you're almost like second guessing or should we go swimming or should we go on this day trip particularly when my son was younger it was like oh the thought of it was very overwhelming and very daunting for us just to think about trying to do those things um and i think people who haven't experienced adhd or they don't understand it they don't they just don't understand how difficult it can be and they don't understand that feeling of overwhelming almost dread of just doing a simple thing like like going swimming or whatever you know whatever it may be it can become the restaurant big and, and having your child um or trying to have your child sit down when you know that they just can't do that but i can laugh now that um when i look back on some of the incidents and the shenanigans that have occurred but i could have nearly died time and time over again at, at something that one of them's either said or done um you just want to you know you just want to shrivel up and get out of there it's it's terrible yeah it's 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 stressful isn't it it's, you know i know being a parent is stressful anyway by just the sheer design of it but i mean it is you know, it's difficult isn't it like you want to take them for food and go and you know go and have some food and sit in a restaurant and they don't want to sit there and wait for half hour for food because they want to go and walk around and have a look at this and climb on the chairs and do this and that. So you're just constantly going in different directions when they, particularly, you know, as they're younger. And I think people who haven't, don't get me wrong, even child, children without ADHD, if you want to go for food and stuff, they don't want to always sit still. But if you've got a child or children with ADHD in that situation, it's almost like dialed up to a hundred and it makes it a very stressful environment for the parent and of course the more agitated and emotional and stressed that the parent is it, that is going to influence how you deal with your child how the child views you and and stuff like that so even that can then cause this escalation of stress and chaos if you like well certainly that's what i found with us it just sounds like you're saying everybody um is is running on high anxiety yeah in those situations but um one of the things i think i've learned to do with my children is to be very selective about the things that we do do so rather than go to a restaurant um where they're expected to sit still um then we will go to a huge park or a huge outdoor area where there's loads of things to climb on and dens to build and we can take a picnic and we can sit there and there's not that expectation then but uh, as well you know i think my used to wheel my children around the supermarket with ipads in their hands and maybe some parents might think oh just sticking them in front of a device but actually if that works for your for you and your child and you are able to sit in a restaurant or get through the supermarket without running up and down the aisles or um, finding them hiding behind blue rolls um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah you've got to find things which work where you know they've got to find things which work for you i know my son 
enjoys like if he's feeling particularly stressed out or emotional or agitated he'll just go up to his room with his tablet and just watch netflix or play a couple of games and then he'll come back half hour later and he'll be calmer and chilled out and i think it's important for for any teenager particularly for any child but particularly children with adhd to be able to go somewhere or just have like a quiet time where when they're agitated they can deal with it without it escalating into or not a shouting match but like arguments with brothers or being told off or whatever it may be if they can take themselves away for 15 minutes yeah i think that's the best that's certainly with my son is one of the most beneficial things he finds is if he can just if i'll say to him look you're getting a bit agitated just take yourself off for 15 minutes and chill out he finds that really beneficial um one of the tricks or not tricks but one of the things we tend to do is if we have if we're going to go for food in a restaurant is we'll go to the carvery where you can just go straight up and get your food and then we do that they have the food because there's no there's no waiting then is there so it's 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 straight away getting their food you can pay and you can go which it sounds horrible doesn't it it sounds like you're sort of like you're not taking them for food but they'd rather do that they'd rather have their food and go they don't want to sit still in a restaurant they'd rather go to the carvery be there 20 minutes and then go to the park and like you say they can just do whatever it they horrible it sounds like that's a strategy that your family needs because you know that um sitting down waiting for 20 30 40 minutes isn't going to work so you found something that works for you and for them yeah and i think that's that's half the battle yeah it's finding different strategies methods coping methods anything which can help you run your family life and your daily routine which doesn't lead to screaming and shouting if it works and it's safe and everything's great then crack on because not everything not everything which works for for me or my son or us will work for you and vice versa because even though my son's got adhd and your sons have got adhd it doesn't mean that they will have the same issues it doesn't mean that they'll have the same things which agitate them it doesn't mean that their symptoms will manifest in the same way so you've just as a family you have to just find things which work for you you do yeah definitely um so have you developed any other things which you can share with little methods or tricks that you've come up with i'm always always happy to pick up new ideas um for managing their adhd yeah just for a general sort of day-to-day running of things i'm always after little tips i think the um the physical activity helps like i say we have um children that quite okay it's, it's perfectly acceptable to do a handstand on the sofa and to do a backflip um on the carpet or on the trampoline or swing off the monkey bars these things are okay we can we can go out for a walk if we're feeling stressed um or a bike ride we just know how to and how not to respond to um their emotions so you're constantly trying to regulate for for your children because um kind of the confrontation or the the um what am i trying to say The normal, guess, the normal ways of trying to discipline your child are not necessarily going to work for your ADHD child. They're going to um, go into that fight and flight mode. So you just you pick your battles. You, you decide what's important. You you be consistent. You know you tell them other expectations, but you also help them. You help them to calm down. You understand them. You appreciate that it's difficult, and um, you don't try and use that real force or that negativity. That's what I think helps. Yeah, I think um, 
one of the things you said there really struck a chord with me was pick your, pick your battles is <clears throat> is trying to pick you know there's going to be a time where you've got to um you've got to tell your child with ADHD to stop what they're doing or not to do something because or they need to do something and it's trying to pick the right one to say right no that's it you can't do that or no you can you go and do this please whatever it may be you, it's picking the right time or the, not the right time but the right what matters what is important that you know that has to stop or you need to do this because if it doesn't really need to be something which is brought up then maybe you can let it go but if it's something say if they might hurt themselves or someone else then it needs to be no nope, you need to stop that and yes sometimes you're gonna end up in a battle if you like and it's just trying to pick the right the right ones to the right ones to pick um <clears throat> I think ultimately being a parent is hard and it's stressful and it is anxiety inducing. I think being a parent of a child with ADHD is equally stressful, if not more. But I think it can also be very rewarding. Um, like one of the best things that's happened to us is watching is going to his last few parents evenings i'd say the last three or four parents evenings have been amazing and his report the last couple of reports because it's for the first time ever in 14 years plus he's he's where his ability should be like he's clever enough to be where he is but it was always a case of trying to navigate the best way to get there and he's finally getting there. So it, from that point of view, it's been incredibly rewarding, but it's been a long road and it's been a stressful road. And, you know, every day can be difficult. Um, I was just going to ask you, if so if, if there was any parents out there now who are struggling with their children who they think, or who have ADHD, or maybe suspect that their children have ADHD, would you uh, what would you say to them or give them sort of any advice or well i think that if you think that your child has adhd then um don't be afraid to speak up go to the doctors ask for an assessment um do your research find out what it is connect to what it is that you think is going on to your child and then yeah, go and speak to the professional and explain your concerns and um advocate for them you know because they need you to do that because they can't do it for themselves yeah absolutely and i think um one thing i'd like to add to that is if you think your child has adhd and you bring it to the to the teacher and you sort of say look i think this is you know and you explain your your reasoning and they disagree that's not that doesn't have to be the end of it. If you, you know, you know your child better than anyone. So if you think they've got ADHD or they're showing symptoms or signs of it, and the teacher or the school disagrees, you can go to your GP or to a charity or whoever it may be, and there are people there who will help you and listen to you. And you need to fight your child's corner because it sounds horrible. But to a school, or to many schools, should we say, your child is just a number, he's just one of many. But to you, it's your child and it's your world. So you need to fight for them, particularly if you think they're struggling or they're having issues. And you need to go and see whoever will listen and make them listen. I think communication is definitely key because... Um, there are a lot of teachers who don't have an awareness or any understanding of ADHD. And so if they don't know what it is and they, they can see the behavior, but they can't understand what the behavior, where, what the behavior stems from, 
then um, then they are going to respond from a behavioural perspective and try to discipline the child and uh, try to make them fit into these um, models of education that the child's never going to be able to fit into. But um, when you do go to GP, very often an assessment will involve um, information from the teacher, the Connors report, for example. So it's about communicating with, with other people who are involved in supporting your child and looking at the evidence for why you might feel that your child is, is suffering with ADHD. So, for example, um, they're not sitting still in their chair, they're not able to concentrate on their work, they are impulsively um, calling out or um, impulsively responding to um, a situation and they are showing signs of overwhelm or sensory overload or um, emotionally um, distressed more so you know the heightened emotions so there, there are always symptoms and it's maybe about communicating and pointing those out to somebody if you don't feel that they understand what's going on does that make sense yeah and i think like you say communication is the the key to it um and then if you can work with the school i think is obviously beneficial uh because they're the ones who are going to be supporting your child in their education and their day-to-day -day school life so getting them on board or explaining your worries is you know a big part of that of that initial step towards making sure your child has the right support in place and as i as i mentioned what works you know what works for for me and my family might not work for you but there is people out there who can help and advise and support you um so my messages uh, on Facebook and Twitter are open. So if anyone ever wants to talk or discuss anything, whether it's about ADHD or any other mental health issues, I'm always open and uh, ready to listen or send, point you in you know, a different direction or wherever it may be. And that's open to anyone, whether I know you or not. Um, one thing I have discovered since doing the shows on ADHD is there is a huge community of people on social media who are raising, the, are raising awareness and helping people and families with ADHD. Um, so there is help there if you need it. Um, I will post some links to some websites and some, <clears throat> some charities, some people on Twitter in the description for the video. So if people want more information or they need to speak to someone, they'll be there. Um, you can find Chantelle on Twitter uh, at ADHD Positive UK. And the website is www.adhdpositive.co.uk. I think that's right, isn't it? Yes, it is. Cool. Um, and like I say, I'll put all the ADHD and mental health charity links in the description on YouTube, as well as the ADHD positive one. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, you can keep up to date on upcoming shows, guests on Twitter is at acecast underscore nation. Um, please subscribe to Ace Podcast Nation on YouTube. And if you click the bell, every time we upload a video, you'll be notified. If you would like to request a show subject, recommend a guest, ask a question to us or one of the guests for one of the shows, you can do so on Facebook by searching Ace Podcast Nation. Uh, like the page and then you can send us uh, a private message or just post a comment if there's anyone you would like to ask a question to. Um, we've lots of shows and interviews coming up over the next week. Uh, I've got one on ADHD with Dr. Wasi Mohammed. Uh, if you'd like to ask him a question, you can send that over on Facebook, which is being recorded on the 9th of May, I think. We've also got shows on conspiracy theories, wrestling, football, uh, the impact of social media, uh, Avengers Endgame review. Um, so there's plenty of videos coming up. Um, <clears throat> whatever tickles your fancy, there's plenty of stuff. And as always, I'll keep updating everything and putting on any links in the videos. Uh, thanks again, Chantal, for your time. And you are certainly welcome back anytime to discuss anything you please.
Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, and remember, everyone, no matter what your situation is, you are never alone, and it's never too late. Thank you for watching, guys. Cheers. Cheers.